right, so now let's think about uh, the alveoli in a little more uh, detail. We have um, some useful numbers for you to keep in mind to help you think about the, the system as it's helpful to think about volumes uh, and, and flow. Think about both uh, capillary and then patient, which is what's happening. Back. We've got fusion, we've got. So the tidal volume, that's about the volume of each breath. It's about half a liter. Um, for a minute, you end up with about 7,500 milliliters per minute. Now, not all of that gets gas exchanged. A lot of it's in this conduction spot, what you might think of as anatomic dead space. There's your trachea dead space. There's not gas exchange. It's not heavily invested with, with capital. Um, so really, your and that's also true of, of uh, physiologic dead space that's not strictly anatomical due to mucus and so on. Uh, and really, your alveolar ventilation is a little less. It's about five liters. Uh, per uh, the actual uh, gas content of your alveoli per se is about 3,000 uh, milliliters. Um, the pulmonary blood flow is also about five liters per minute, that's typical cardiac output. All the blood goes you know, through the lungs. Now, um, I mentioned this tidal volume. What other lung parameters are relevant? Different things can go wrong. This is your sort of tidal volume. It's like a tide. It's how you're normally breathing. As you know, you can actually increase, take a deep breath in, inspire deeply. And so you've got a, a higher total lung capacity than your typical tidal volume uh, gets you to. And also expire more deeply than you normally would. Maximal voluntary vital capacity in and out, that's called your vital capacity is much, much greater than your typical. Now, um, there actually, you, there's some that you can't even push out. So you maximally push out as much as you can, but that's still some there, okay, and that's called the residual. Uh, volume, okay, important when thinking about gas. You've got a th few different relevant things. Residual volume plus vital capacity is the total lung. Some parts of these can go wrong. You can imagine, for example, uh, if there was a, a process that impaired the expansion of a lung maximally, have your tidal volume might be okay for a while, Vital, your total lung capacity might be dropping, and then as the disease state progress, approach into the uh, tidal volume, and or a little bit before that, uh, exercise relevant tidal volume, which would be a little great. How a disease process can be going on for a while before it's uh, so. Uh, there's a few interesting things going on. There's a propensity of alveoli to collapse and for the lung to collapse. And why is that the case? Well, there's, there's, there's part of it is uh, water uh, surface tension, okay? So you've got uh, this natural uh, hydrogen bonding that water likes to do, creating immense surface tension. And the natural uh, condition would be for everything to collapse. And so you've got and that can happen in various disease states. It's not the end of the world. But if the alveoli collapse, that's going to reduce the ventilation that's happening in part of the lung, but not another part that has not collapsed. And that's not affecting the blood flow. The blood flow is still going through. And then you've, what you've got then is a ventilation perfusion mismatch. A lot of your blood that's going through the lung is going through alveoli that are not inflated. What's that going to do? Well, that's going to reduce the oxygen available to the blood because a lot of the blood, even though the heart's perfectly fine, even though the lung's being perfectly well perfused, some of it's not being, going through alveoli that are not uh, ventilated. Then you can get the opposite that can happen. Uh, what, what if you had a, uh, uh, an embolism? What if you, you know, clotted off part of a blood vessel going to the lung? Uh, well, your lung's still being perfused. You've got ventilation coming through, but you're not perfusing that part of the lung. And so you've got a, a different kind of Uh, and so there's, there's a different things that can happen, uh, and, and the 
balance between those can be diagnosed by different measures. That we'll now, the flow is complex. Uh, there's, um, you know, at, at low speeds, it's, uh, it's a Newtonian fluid. It has constant properties. Uh, incompressible form of the Navier-Stokes equations, uh, relatively straightforward, but involves uh, densities of fluid, velocity, pressure, uh, viscosity measure, and then uh, all term for other body forces uh, help us understand the, the flow at, at, at low speeds. Now, um, for a first approximation that actually works, uh, and you can actually even model the walls as uh, rigid flow as uh, laminar. But uh, at high flow rates, uh, you start to get into uh, turbulent flow. And so in large vessels, uh, the flow is not laminar. And so you can get uh, relatively uh, a difficult uh, model of properties and then a transitional where the, f the flow is actually quite difficult to understand. So often we want to measure, not just model, but actually measure because our models are not going to be good enough. So we um, have various devices that we use to measure respiration flows, uh, pressures, volumes. And one very simple device is basically a strain gauges, basically by stretching up a strap that you can wear on the, the chest uh, to detect chest expansion. Um, there are piezoelectric uh, devices that can be used to measure it. Um, Laboratory uh, settings, you can use Doppler uh, setups to, to detect uh, chest wall motion. It's also true that breathing is a little complicated. Um, the diaphragm, which is this uh, sheet of muscle that more or less forms the border between your thorax and your abdomen, that's a tractal muscle uh, that regulates the expansion and contraction of the thorax, but also all your ribs <coughs> have muscles between them, and those are synchronized as well and help facilitate the uh, uh, contraction of the, uh, of the thorax, and those are called intercostal muscles. Those are little strips of muscle that uh, lie between the rib. And uh, those can fail in different settings. Uh, if you have uh, a rib fracture uh, and, or if you disrupt uh, intercostal muscles, you can have localized uh, impairments in uh, inflation of the chest wall, and that can cause local uh, problems, uh, impaired uh, ventilation. Those are uh, things that change uh, their sh shape very rapidly in response to an electrical. So I've actually, I haven't seen these in operation. Jay, have you seen these? Uh, in, in? So there are, but they're used, uh, basically a small electrical pulse causes a, a very instantaneous. Um, uh, sort of forefront of uh, items that can be used. In you can also measure uh, gas exchange with uh, labeled uh, nanoparticles. And this is done primarily in normal models, but uh, can also be done. The rat, though, is actually a good uh, model um, for human respiratory development. There's this. Uh, transition process between what's called the saccular stage and the fully developed uh, alveolar stage. We're born, a lot of our alveoli still, many of them are still sort of little outpouchings, uh, look like just little outpouchings at the end of a terminal bronchial. You don't have this fully uh, developed uh, sort of cluster of grapes-like uh, structure. And obviously that's pretty important in thinking about the uh, surface area to volume ratios and the dynamics uh, rats also have that process. They're born with their lungs in sort of the saccular developed alveolar stage. Uh, that's actually good because then you can use rats to study uh, uh, nanoparticles, thinking about drug delivery, and then you can go in and histologically assess. You can try different uh, particle sizes. You can look at different uh, ages of the uh, rats become adult by the time they're about old, and you can actually see different particles get deposited uh, with different efficiencies. 
stages, and that's important for understanding designing treatments for uh, 